Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. Thanksgiving is over and we're now entering into the Christmas season, if you can believe that. So we're starting this year's Christmas series entitled The Hope of Christmas. And this is our first message in the series entitled The Promise of Christmas. You know, if you think about it, it's really hope that we're celebrating every 25th of December. The hope that only Jesus can give. The hope of eternal life with him. Therefore, the promise of Jesus is our Christmas hope. So would you turn with me please to the scripture, Genesis chapter 22, verse 15 through 19. It's not our typical Christmas scripture, but it is the promise of Christmas. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young man, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. As I mentioned, this is not your typical Christmas scripture. And I'm pretty sure that some of you may be scratching your head and thinking, what in the world is Brother Kenny talking about? He's grasping at straws here. Well, let me lay a small, small foundation for you. Abraham was formerly known as Abram. And God had given Abram a promise that he would be the father of a multitude of nations. The problem with the promise was Abram had no children and he was 99 years old, according to Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, when he got the covenant of circumcision. The other problem was Sarai, his wife, was 90 years old, according to Genesis chapter 17, verse 17. But that was no never mind to God. God said, look, your name shall no longer be Abram, but Abraham, because you will be the father of many nations, and Sarai's new name will be Sarah. Take a look with me at Genesis chapter 17, verse 5 through 6. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. God said, it's already done, Abraham. Now, I don't want you to miss this. Abraham hasn't seen it. Sarah hasn't delivered it. But God saw it, God knew it, and God spoke it. He said, I have already made you a father of a multitude of nations. Please understand that God did not say a multitude of people. He said a multitude of nations, meaning many, many nations. Not just the nation of Israel, but many nations. Abraham, or Abram, and Sarai had already tried to help God out with the promise. And Ishmael was the result, the son of the slave woman. But God's promises, none of his promises are enslaved. Neither does he need any help bringing his promise to come to pass, which whatever he declared will be so. <clears throat> Although, at the time, Abram might not have understood the full promise, the promise of Christmas, 
But Abraham, the new man, the coveted friend of God, he understood for he longed to see Jesus' day. And Jesus said that he did see it and rejoiced. Look at Jesus' own words in John chapter 8, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it and was glad, is what Jesus said. Abraham saw the promise of Christmas. So meanwhile, back at the old homestead, God has come through for Abraham and for Sarah. And, and as he had sworn, as he had told them, as he had given them that promise, he gave them a son whom they named Isaac. They have the promised son just like God had promised them. They, Sarah's bouncing at 99 years old. She's bouncing a little baby that she delivered. And she's nursing this little baby at 99 years old. Is anything too hard for God? Has God given you a promise? You can stand on that promise because God is faithful and not one of his good promises will fail. Now, here Abraham is on Mount Moriah about to sacrifice his son Isaac in obedience to God. But how did he get there? Look with me at Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And this is God speaking. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I want you to just think about that for just a moment. Think about what God just told Abraham. He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love. Does that not sound a little contradictory? I mean, he says, your son, your only son, Isaac. Remember, Abraham has another son, Ishmael. But God does not count that son because it is the son of the promise and not the son of bondage that Abraham's descendants are reckoned. Look at, at Genesis chapter 21, verse 12. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. You see, Sarah had caught Ishmael mocking Isaac. She got the slave, the son of the slave woman, mocking the promise. Sometimes people will mock your promise. Did God really tell you that? It's been so long. Your promise might not be a promise after all. God can't deliver with his promise. People will mock that promise, just like Isaac was mocking Ish, or just like Ishmael was mocking Isaac at his weaning party. And Sarah said, uh-uh, he's got to go. And not just him, but his mama too, because the son of the slave woman will never inherit the blessing with my son. They had a promise. And Sarah intended to stand on that promise. But Abraham was very distressed over the matter because, after all, he loved his son Ishmael as well. Probably not as much as he loved Isaac, but he loved them all the same. Because Ishmael is his son also. But God brings Abraham's focus back to the promise, the promise of Christmas. He said, look, Abraham, this is what it's really all about. It's through Isaac that the promise of Christmas 
will come. And that is the most important thing because this is the promise for the whole world, not just your little family, not just you and Sarah, but it's for the whole world. So some people always say, so Brother Kenny, what exactly then is the promise of Christmas? Well, it is not so much what, it is a who. Not a who like a who villain the Grinch who stole Christmas. What I mean is this. Turn with me please to Galatians chapter 3 verse 15 through 18. Brethren, I speak in the manner of man. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And there you have it. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the promise of Christmas. Without Jesus, there would be no, in those days, there was went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. The most famous Christmas sentence in, in, in the whole of scripture. There would be no nativity scene. There would be no manger scene. No shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. No heart the herald angels sing. No wise men traveling afar following that star. No Christmas presents under a tree. No Christmas tree period. No jingle bells. No celebrations at all. For it was Jesus, who stepped out of eternity and stepped into time, being born of a virgin, being wrapped in swaddling clothes, and being laid in a manger because there was no room for him in the end. The whole promise of Christmas is about Jesus. As the yard sign so boldly states, Jesus is the reason for the season. Even though Isaac is a type of Christ, he was not actually sacrificed because although his father had bound him, although his father had laid him on the altar, although he had a sacrificial knife held in his upraised hands about to slay his son, the angel of God stopped him before he finished or completed the sacrifice. Jesus, who is the true and real promise of Christmas, was the true sacrifice for us. Nobody stayed anybody's hand at his sacrifice. He was mercilessly beaten. He was spit upon. He was slapped and had his beard plucked from his face. The vicious crown of thorns was jammed onto or into his brow. His hands and his feet were viciously nailed to the cross. His blood actually flowed as a payment for us. Jesus actually closed his eyes in death. But on the third day, Jesus rose again to life, never again to be beaten, never again to be spit upon, never again to be slapped, never again to be punched, never again to be scorned, never again to be ridiculed, never again to be put to open shame, never again to die. But he lives forever, and all power and all authority are given to him. Praise the name of the Lord. And that, my friends, is the promise of Christmas. Why? Because Jesus gave us the first Christmas present. It is the gift that keeps on giving, because it is the free gift of life. And he offers that to each and every one, whomsoever will can come and receive that Christmas gift of life, life eternal. 
From the very beginning, God had in mind what he would do to redeem mankind. Though it was dark and gloomy, though it was hopeless and without light, and yet a light shone in the darkness, the light of Jesus Christ. In the words of the old beloved song, or that old beloved Christmas carol, O Holy Night, long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angels' voices. Oh, night divine. Oh, night when Christ was born. That is the true and real meaning of the promise of Christmas. The night when Jesus the Christ came as a little helpless baby born in a manger, manger because there was no room for them in the end. The same is true today. Jesus is knocking at the door of our hearts, but there's no room for him in our busy lives. There's no room for him in prayer. There's no room for devotions. There's no room for Bible reading. There's no room for meditations. There's no room for church. There's no room for, for anything that is really scriptural, for time to set aside to spend with Jesus Christ. In other words, there is no room for him. In the end, we've gotten, we've forgotten what Christmas is all about. We're not seeing the real significance of Christmas. It's like that story that I read about the Wright brothers. Apparently, Orville and Wilbur Wright had tried repeatedly to fly a heavier than air craft. Finally, one December, off the dunes of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, they did what man had never done before. They actually flew. Elated, they wired their sister Catherine, a quote, we have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas, end of quote. Hastily, she ran down the street shoved the telegram, the new scoop of the century, as it was, at, under the city editor of the local newspaper's nose. He read it carefully and smiled. And this is what he said. Well, well, how nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. No, 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 sir, you've missed the point. You've missed the point completely. That editor missed the whole story, probably because he didn't or couldn't believe that man could actually fly a heavier than air craft. Or maybe the promise of flight was taken much longer than expected, therefore it can't happen. Or maybe the promise was too much for him to grasp. Or whatever the reason is, the editor did not grasp, he did not understand the promise, the promise of flight. It's the same with man today. They do not grasp the promise, or they refuse to believe the promise, for whatever reason. To them, just like that editor, it's all foolishness and hogwash, because the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of Almighty God. The promise of Christmas is the promise of eternal life. So do not be like that city editor of the local newspaper in the, the Wright Brothers' hometown. In his short-sightedness, he did not see the big picture because flying 120 feet was meaningless to him, but it was really a big, big deal. 
the birth of a tiny baby in the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, being laid in a manger after being swaddled in, uh, in swaddling clothes, sounds insignificant, just like flying 120 feet. What is that in the scheme of things? The truth of the matter is, without the birth, we could not have the death. Without the death, we could not have eternal life. So in closing, let me invite you to a second look at the true and real promise of Christmas and receive the real Christmas present this Christmas season, which is the gift of salvation. Jesus is offering you, he's offering me, he's offering everybody the choice of life. He's saying, choose life and live. So if you would like to accept Jesus' free gift of life and live forever, all you have to do is to ask. All you have to do is to repeat this prayer after me. you got to mean it with your heart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for taking so lightly the birth and death of your son Jesus, for trampling his blood underfoot. Forgive me. I accept now your free gift, that first Christmas gift of life, your gift of salvation. I choose life today that I might live with you forever. Thank you, Lord. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get yourself a Bible, get a highlighter, read your Bible, highlight your Bible, highlight those scriptures, those promises, those promises that are meaningful to you. The promises that God gave you. Memorize those promises. Hide them away in your heart that you might not sin against them. Find yourself a Bible-believing church. One that still believes in a right way and in a wrong way. Believe a church that believes that Jesus is coming back to get us real, real soon. And our hearts have to be right with him. For he's coming for the pure in heart. Not doing anything that the world says is okay. For it's not the world that we have to be judged by on Judgment Day. It's God's standard. It's not the world's standard. It's God's standard. Make sure you know what he's going to be looking for when he comes back. So if you prayed that prayer, the Lord has saved you. You're now a child of God. You now have eternal life. So may the Lord bless you richly. May he, he give you the, the strength to overcome sin and temptation. That when he comes back, he'll find you doing exactly what it is he called you to do. I want to say thank you also for joining us. I, we really, really appreciate it here at Hope. At Hold the Hope. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.